Welcome to Econ Talk, part of the Library of Economics and Liberty. I'm your host, Russ Roberts, of George Mason University and Stanford University's Hoover Institution. Our website is econtalk.org, where you can subscribe, find other episodes, comment on this podcast, and find links and other information related to today's conversation. Our email address is mail at econtalk.org. We'd love to hear from you. My guest today is William Easterly, professor of economics at New York University and author of The White Man's Burden and The Elusive Quest for Growth. Bill, welcome to Econ Talk. Thanks, Russ. It's great to be here. Our topic for today is economic development and foreign aid, poverty, uh, the subjects of, of both of your uh, books. In the beginning of The White Man's Burden, you argue that the West has spent a mere $2.3 trillion over the last 60 years in the hopes of ending poverty and creating growth. How are we doing? Not too well. Uh, this is really one of one of the great tragedies of our generation is that all this goodwill and all these financial resources were, were out there for the cause of trying to help the world's poorest and most desperate people, and yet all the evidence that has accumulated over 50 years is that very little of it actually reached the poor. Let me just give you one one example of that, uh, of that amount, nearly $600 billion of that went into Africa. Africa is the most aid-intensive continent. And economic growth per person in Africa has been zero over that whole period. There's, that is, the uh, standard of living of the average African is no higher today than it was 50 years ago, despite this massive aid effort. It clearly is a sign that, that all that aid money was, was not reaching the poor. Why didn't it get there? Where did it go? And what were the expectations of where it would go? And why didn't why weren't those expectations met? Well, let's talk about the why first. I think uh, one really unique thing about aid is that there is no, no way for the intended beneficiaries, the people we're trying to help, to give any feedback on whether it's working for them or not, whether the money is reaching them or not. And that's, you know, obviously the exact opposite of what happens in a consumer market where if the consumer doesn't like the product, they don't buy it, and that makes the the firm sit up and take notice and change the product, or if they don't change, they go out of business. So in markets, we have feedback mechanisms that ensure that people get what they want, an aid that was totally missing, that was just completely, completely not there, because of course the, the the aid recipients are getting things for free, so they have no purchasing power mechanism to communicate whether they're happy or not. And uh, aid agencies made surprisingly little effort to do any evaluation or any surveying or anything to find out if the money really was reaching the poor. So uh, you know when you when you operate in the dark, that's when um, the worst things tend to happen, well, uh, and that's uh, that's really the story, sad story of the aid industry is it's been operating in the dark, and you know the the results have not been happy. Well, the feedback um, H. L. Mencken uh, has a has a great quote that I like. That he says, "Conscience is the feeling that someone might be watching." Mm-hmm. <laughs> that's it. That kind of conscience, uh, you know, makes most of us behave. Well, uh, in aid, uh, no one was watching. And so really the aid, uh, aid industry is surprisingly conscience-free. Well, it's understandable that the feedback loop's missing from the recipient side because presumably some of those would-be recipients didn't know that money was headed their way. It was absconded with by leaders and others. It's a little more surprising that the agencies. Uh, didn't do more to v- evaluate and, and monitor what their money was doing. I understand that their incentives aren't there, particularly if they don't do a good job. In fact, you could argue their incentives are the opposite. The better yeah. job they do, the, yeah. the less money they'll have to hand out and the less important they'll be. Yeah, that's exactly it. Um, you know, the, No matter how noble the purpose of any bureaucracy, the, um, the main rationale that the main motivation that drives a bureaucracy is always to perpetuate its own existence. But I, I have and many... that's, uh, that's uh, unfortunately true of aid. I mean, there are a lot of good-hearted people that work in aid agencies, but um, 
they realized that if they did do evaluations of whether the money was reaching the poor and and the results turned out to be negative, that would be disastrous publicity for their fundraising for future aid. And so they didn't. They just didn't do it. I have many friends at the World Bank. I, I assume you you still do as well. Yes, I do too. And, yes. and you work uh, there. Yeah, I think uh, very highly of lots and lots of people there. When you were there, what incentives were were acting on you as a as an as a uh, member of that bureaucracy that you're free and happy to talk about to a general audience? Yeah, well, I was in the research department. I wasn't in the on the front lines, um, but it was very obvious even from um, you know the vantage point of the research department that the main incentives inside the bank were to keep the money flowing. That is, you. In fact, we we even felt this incentive in the research department. Oddly enough, the you know the the number one rule in in the bureaucracy was to spend your budget to to make the full amount of the loans that were that were planned for at the beginning of the year. No matter what is going on and on the receiving end, if it's a you know a political gangster running the country, stealing all the money, you still have the very strong incentive to make sure the money goes out the door. Because otherwise, you know, what's your rationale for staying in business? What's your rationale for getting getting the budget next period? Well, let's move on to something equally uh, cheerless. Uh, in, in, <laughs> I hope we get more cheerful. Yeah, we will at the end. You know, at the very end, I have a cheerful question. But overall, I have to warn our listeners that this is not going to be the usual fun fest here at Econ Talk. This is a somewhat depressing topic. But one of the themes of your books, which I agree with and love, is um, truth is important and romance is dangerous, not just um, pleasant. It's dangerous when it's involving people's lives. In in The Elusive Quest for Growth, you do a marvelous job reviewing the various intellectual themes in economics uh, vis-a-vis development, uh, the way economists have looked at growth over time and what what we thought were the keys to development, and Mm -hmm. those – are fads of a sort. They come and go. They mostly come and go, and sometimes they come and go more than once. But yeah, but yeah. they originally, in the early days, for example, uh, investment was the key, and the secret, as you as you point out, at the time was thought to be, uh, we just need to get a lot of investment in these poor countries because we know that investments related to growth. Right. Uh, that didn't work. Why not? And what are some of the other fads that um, we've given up on? At least we've learned something. Well, you know, we we forgot as development economists one of the the main insights of economics, which is that incentives matter. You know, and so the the naive idea and the naive expectation was that if you just give money to poor countries who are not investing enough that they will take that money and invest it, and that will cause them to grow and thus uh, climb out of poverty and achieve economic development. Uh, well, that's the reason that it fails is exactly because of this simple insight that incentives matter. If there's no incentive to invest the money, if, uh, for example, the economy is such that uh, anyone investing can expect that their profits are going to be confiscated by the by the anti-business government that is in power, then obviously they don't, they don't have an incentive to invest. And so the money flowing into the economy will not go into investment. It will wind up financing consumption, oftentimes government consumption, expanding government payrolls, expanding political patronage. And the empirical evidence is pretty clear that that's exactly what happened with eight dollars. And I have to say that after I read that section of the book, I thought, well, of course, although I would also been schooled in the idea that growth comes from K and L, where K is capital, and that's a form of investment or technology. And uh, But I knew, I knew that, that there was something that, that would help create growth. I kept waiting in the book for this, the chapter that I knew would be the truth. And of course, I knew, as, as all good economists know, that education is the key to growth and the key – to uh, getting ahead because we know that education is a form of capital. It's called We call it human capital. So that while investments in dams and bridges and various infrastructures, yes, those could be boondoggles and corrupt, surely education would turn out to be the decisive factor in uh, growth. But alas, that also did not turn out to be the case, correct? 
No, no. I'm, well, I'm sorry to be purveying doom and gloom here. I, we, we will get to something more cheerful eventually. But you know, the the problems with the education are pretty similar to the problems with investment. That um, you know, if you if you build schools and hire teachers, uh, that doesn't guarantee that people will feel the incentive to actually invest a lot of effort in acquiring skills and that parents will invest a lot of effort in making sure their kids do their homework and monitoring the teachers, making sure the teachers are doing a good job. Those incentives are not are not so strong in an economy where there are not good economic opportunities for people with, with skills. And so uh, education does not reliably translate in, into economic growth either, unfortunately. Or better yet, there's spending. There's also a, uh, a huge quality problem yeah. in education. You know, the, um, the education is... Education is a government-owned sector in in developing countries. Of course, it is in uh, in, a lot, in most countries. And with a dysfunctional government, you also have dysfunctional schools. You have you know teachers appointed for political reasons. Sometimes there are examples of teachers teaching fourth grade who only have a third grade education when they were a political appointee. You know, or there's the school buildings that are uh, because the teachers. Is not even bothering to show up because they're just collecting their salary as a political patronage payoff. You know, there, were, there was an example we found in a survey in Pakistan where the local landowner had turned all the local school buildings into into cattle sheds. You know, to to keep the goats and the, and the cows. Uh, you know, that's the sad reality of of what happens when you have a, a dysfunctional government running uh, running the education system. We did a podcast with Rick Hanischek that listeners can find in the archives on that issue of quality. It was very, uh, very interesting, very true. Um, one of the themes of The White Man's Burden, uh, your second book, is that people have been arguing for decades that we just need to raise enough money, create the right plan to end world poverty. And you have many tragicomic quotes about how each plan is announced with great fanfare and a deadline to show that's, that this is really – a real plan, and, and there's going to be results, but of course the plans always seem to fail, uh, and they're replaced by a new plan that this time will make all the difference. Why did those plans fail, despite perhaps the best intentions of, of their authors? Well, once again, the, the problem is uh, lack of feedback and lack of knowledge at the top. You know, planning, is, uh, these plans fail basically for the same reasons that pl- central planning in the Soviet Union failed. That uh, People at the top just cannot possibly have enough or process enough information about all the different needs that exist at the bottom to, to take on this huge administrative task of directing resources to meet all of the people's needs at the bottom. And that system just doesn't work because it's a system with too little knowledge at the top and no, no feedback mechanism from the bottom. And that's pretty much the system that we have in foreign aid. We have a large bureaucracy at the top, like the World Bank or the United Nations, announcing these great plans and then trying to direct resources administratively. But, um, you know, they, with so little knowledge at the top and so little feedback from the bottom, where resources just go every which way and fail to meet the, the most pressing needs. You make a, a very nice distinction between planners and searchers. Describe that uh, for, for the audience. Yeah, this the planners are, are the ones I just described, the, uh, the central planners who are operating at the top and announcing their grand plans. And, you know, unfortunately, they often win the battle politically in foreign aid because the, the rules in foreign aid seem to be that whoever, whoever promises the most wins the argument. You know, so um, if, if Bono or Jeffrey Sachs promises the, the end of world poverty, uh, even if they're you know, upon scrutiny, their promise is extremely unlikely to be kept. Uh, that by promising the most, they they grab the headlines, they win the political argument, they get the endorsements of uh, all the Hollywood celebrities and so on. Whereas the searchers are uh, much less likely to get cele- celebrity status. They are people out there in the field, close to the people who, who have the needs that need to be met, who are just experimenting by trial and error what does work to meet the needs of, of people in, the, in, in poor villages, in poor slums of 
surrounding uh, surrounding cities, and that they're they're sort of the uh, analog to the role of the entrepreneur in the free market. Uh, the you know the entrepreneur operates by trial and error until they find a, a product that customers want, and that's uh, in the best case what field workers and aid do is they they just they they admit they're humble that they know they know very little about what what will work to meet the needs of these very poor people. They they don't even know what these needs are. They have to look at things from the vantage of the poor people and not from the vantage of what they th- what they think the poor people should need. And they uh, are close enough to the people and up and do enough trial and error experiments that they find things that work, like uh, some clever way to get malaria bed nets to potential malaria victims rather than, you know, the big planners who just announced the big global malaria eradication program, you know, but has no effective way of actually getting bed nets to uh, to malaria-prone populations. Yeah, just to come back to our earlier theme of the failed um, cures that seemed at the time to be so obviously going to work, uh, one of the most depressing failed um themes was the role of markets. So you've just talked about how well markets work because of the feedback loops. And of course, uh, I'm very sympathetic to that idea. I think it is the the essence of why a successful economy grows. So some folks decided, well, obviously, if it's not investment and it's not education, we just need markets because markets have feedback loops. And even that solution failed as a top-down planner-imposed uh, big idea. Why was that? Right. Well, um, you know, planners, when they are, if if they do become convinced of the virtues of a market, which I, I certainly hope they'd, that everyone does become convinced of that, because free markets in the long run we know are the really the only proven path to prosperity. Uh, but when you put the uh, implementation of a free market in the hands of a bureaucrat, what you get is sort of a a central plan to impose free markets on another society that is not that is not used to free markets, has doesn't have the supporting norms and values and institutions that are necessary for free markets to operate, and thus, you know, once again, we're stuck with uh, the failure of planning. You c- you can't plan a market any more than you can plan a malaria program. And where you know where that failure became most visible, of course, was shock therapy in the former Soviet Union, where all these Western economists flew in and said, you know, well, just free prices and and you know, presto, you will have a free market. Private property. Uh, yeah, just free free prices and you know, have private property and presto, you have a free market. But of course, you know, the Soviet Union had gone seventy years without any experience of a free market, no supporting institutions, no values or norms of kind of fair dealing. And so you got a lot of operators uh, stealing other people's money, but not uh, not much market if efficient markets operating to improve the well-being of the population. You got uh, actually one of the worst recessions in economic history following the attempt at shock therapy. Yeah, a friend and of mine told me he was holding a conference in Russia after liberalization, and he had a bunch of rooms reserved, and a few days before the conference, the manager of the hotel called him, and he co- told him he could only have half the rooms that he'd reserved. And uh, the guy said, what are you talking about? We had a contract. Right. I said, well, right. I got a better offer. And, right. Right. and he said, so sue me, you know? Right. And in America, right. in, you know, right. Right. suing people is, is expensive, and right. Right. Uh, it, most people uh, don't want to be sued, but that isn't the only reason that hotels in America keep their contracts. It's just bad form. Uh, right, right. It's embarrassing yeah. and humiliating to be that opportunistic in America, even though right, we honor right. profits. So that cultural shortcoming must be a big problem. Yeah, um, I mean, and of course, as economists, we don't really understand very well where these norms and values come from. Uh, or cultural, if you want to call it culture, or whatever we should call it. But you're right. It's we call it C for culture in our models. But yeah, we really don't have a great theory behind it. <laughs> but um, but we definitely know that you you're you're totally right. That example is great. That uh, you know, keeping your promises, uh, honoring contracts. These are all not 
not cheating your business partners. Uh, these are all sort of norms that people have to uh, internalize inside themselves to make uh, make markets work. Uh, otherwise, the enforcement mechanisms of formal courts are, are just way too costly to make markets work. It's very naive to say, well, just you know, implement a Western court system mm-hmm. and then markets will work. That yeah. that doesn't work either. The other thought I had listening to your uh, top down story is. Uh the irony of how many of these lessons apply to the United States. We think of these as being third world developing country problems, but we tried imposing a market from above bureaucratically in California in the energy uh, right, right. solution, and they just didn't quite get it right. They were close, but because it did not emerge organically but rather was imposed, it became an incredible opportunity for opportunistic behavior. And, of course, our school systems have some of the problems we've been talking about with the lack of feedback and accountability. And I remember somebody asking me if I was in favor of giving X billion dollars to poor countries for education. And I said, we can't even fix and improve education in the United States where we're close to the problem. Why would you think that sending money abroad would help? I mean, it's a lovely idea, but... Yeah, yeah. Yeah. a number of scholars talk about traps um, as poverty as a trap that somehow you get stuck in. What's your perspective on that? Well, I, I think the whole idea of the poverty trap and development is, is a myth. It's, Why? Uh, well, you know, it's, uh, it could have been true. Uh, you know, as economists, uh, we know... We know a lot about how there can be multiple equilibria, that you could have one, uh, you, you can have vicious and virtuous circles. You know, we have lots of theories about these possibilities, but um, the acid test is what, do, what, what does the data say? You know, what, what, what do the data say? And when you look at the data, there's really no evidence that poor countries are caught in a poverty trap. Uh, the simplest test is just and divide up the all the countries in the world from poorest to richest and uh, and see if the, the poorest group of countries fail to grow as the poverty trap story w- would predict. And actually it turns out that uh, that, that prediction is just blown, blown out of the water, that uh, poor, the poorest countries have pretty much the same growth rate as the richest countries. There's no tendency for the poorest countries to get stuck and fail to grow. And why does it appear that there's a poverty trap? Well, one reason is that um, you know people design these tests in very flawed ways. Uh, you know, there's a, a well-known fallacy in in doing this kind of test that if you look at the end of the period who is poor, then uh, of course they had the worst growth, and so it might appear that the the poor had the worst growth because the poor at the at the end of the period are those who, uh, you know, mechanically by definition had have had the worst growth over some previous period and thus became became poor while everyone else was growing and becoming rich. So I think that that kind of fallacy, which is, um, you know, which is just pure circular reason that, uh, you know, being poor is equivalent to having had uh, a lousy growth record for a long time and being rich is equivalent to having had a good growth record for a long time. That, that kind of uh, fallacious association is, I think, one of the, one of the reasons people think there is a trap, but uh, of course that doesn't, that's a fallacy that doesn't hold up to, to serious scientific testing. Well, it's a fallacy of composition, is correct? Because they're not the same countries that you're looking at necessarily. Right, at, right. At also, the, the um, you know, different countries are entering and exiting the, uh, the, the poorest, uh, say the poorest fifth, for, poorest 20%. If you look at that group, that group doesn't at all stay the same. It is massive. Turnover, both uh, you know, people leaving and new countries declining from above into the into the poverty. So the idea of this sort of static, stagnant pool at the bottom uh, is just completely inconsistent with the data. You know, anyone who takes the data seriously has to know that that is a myth. Well, Paul Collier was a recent guest here, and I want you to react to a couple things. One, you're talk, we're talking about right now. Collier talks about traps, uh, and he makes a persuasive case that countries that get mired in conflict and in civil war, rebellions of various kinds, do tend to get stuck in, in a, an unpleasant circle. Do you think that's true? Do you, do you think that work is correct? 
Uh, well, in a, in short, no. <laughs> I totally, I totally disagree with that's, that's uh, very short. Professor Collier. Give us a longer version. Of uh, that. The, I'll give you the long version. Um, you know, Professor Collier has done some some solid research in his career, identifying really interesting correlations between you know natural resource exporting and Dutch disease and natural resources and civil war and so on. Dutch disease would be where a country that has a resource doesn't thrive as you'd expect, but rather struggles to manage the resource well. Right, correct? right. And um, so, you know, I, I respect him as a colleague, but um, in his latest book, The Bottom Billion, I think he was falling prey to some of those same fallacies that I just mentioned. Uh, he, you know, the whole idea of the bottom billion is basically uh, one big fallacy. It's uh, it's exactly what we were just talking about. The bottom billion is measured at the the end of the period. So of course they are the the countries that at the end of fifty years of history are the poorest countries. Are countries to which a lot of bad things have happened. You know they've had uh, the worst growth. They've had a lot of war and political instability. They've had coups and. Uh, all these other things that Collier talks about. But this is just, um, you know, a, a fallacy of looking at things from the wrong end of the telescope. Uh, if you, you know, it's like, um, let's think of an analogy. Suppose you um, uh, accompanied a tour group to uh, Las Vegas of, uh, you know, 100 people who are going to be gambling in the casinos in Las Vegas. And then at the end of the... Uh, two-week trip, you found out, you you asked around and identified the poorest person there. And you find you find out, big surprise, the poorest person was uh, the one who had the worst luck in the casino during the two-week trip. Uh, that's just, you know, by definition, you, uh, so you, you must have lost most of your bets and had the worst luck to wind up to be the poorest at the end of two weeks in Las Vegas even though everyone faced exactly the same odds beforehand. So there was no uh, you know, sort of bettors trap that one, uh, one, one group of bettors faced worse odds than the other. It's just at the end of the period, those that had the worst luck wound off, of course, worse off. And that's essentially the whole, that's the whole fallacy behind Collier's book, is that uh, the bottom billion are those who wound up worst off at the end of the period. So, of course, they had lots of bad stuff happen to them. So you're arguing that, that in the next, say, 25 years, uh, there's no likelihood that they'll be stuck there, that many of them will do well. Other countries that are doing well now will fall down for a variety of reasons, bad governance, luck, etc. Exactly. Exactly. Well, I, think um, a, I think a bet would be in order here, a la yeah. the uh, Ehrlich, Julian, Simon bet <clears throat> yeah, about yeah. the uh, – since I'm sure – I'm sure Paul Collier would, would dispute your claim and would yep. tell you that his empirical work shows that this is not the case. It's not random, that these correlations are causal. I think just for the readers, who, the listeners who haven't read the underlying work, I think it's important to point out that the key issue here is causation versus correlation, a theme we've yes, talked about yes. a number of times here in a yes. variety of podcasts, the Ian Ayers podcast and the Nassim Taleb yes. podcast. Yeah. Um, so the issue is what what Collier has shown is that there is a correlation between these countries that have done poorly and, say, uh, conflict. You're disputing whether that's causation. You're suggesting that, right. that, there, right. that, that some of those countries won't have conflict over the next 20 years and will do fine or at least better than average. Well, than I, the average of the other tw- I think I'm saying countries. something even stronger than uh, than it's just a problem of uh, correlation rather than causation. I'm saying that the the correlation was itself biased to be to imply a poverty trap when there was when there was none. So there, 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 I'm not just saying that it's a correlation that was not causation. I'm saying the correlation is not even real. It's. Uh, it's biased by the because of the mistake of end of measuring the outcome at measuring who's at the bottom at the end of the period after, which then you know captures all the bad stuff that has gone before. Well, the correct would... way to do the test is to ask you know who is poorest at the beginning of the period and then say 
you know, do they have a higher probability of getting stuck? Who has who has the worst civil war at the beginning of the period, and then do they have a higher probability of getting stuck in poverty? And Collier doesn't do that. So that's just an elementary methodological error that I think is is driving his work. But beyond that, you're right. Uh, he does run some other regressions in which he just looks at um, things like, you know, if is civil war, the probability of civil war affected by a foreign aid, like technical assistance. And those are correlations that he found in the data, but um, as you said, they're not causal. We can't really infer that a, a new foreign aid program would reduce the probability of civil war. Let me talk about another aspect of his worldview, which is shared by lots of others, and we can, we can get off the, um, the, the Collier issue per se. Uh, he and others are much more optimistic about AIDS potential benefits than you are. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Uh, he's not a, an ivory tower theorist. You aren't either. You've both spent mm-hmm. a great mm-hmm. deal of time in places on the ground with mm-hmm. desperately poor people, mm-hmm. yet he and other – Economists and you know, a few other types of, of activists argue that aid can make a difference. You are much more skeptical. I'd like your opinion of why you think reasonable people can come to such disparate conclusions. How much of those of those differences are due to the way you read the data versus philosophical differences? Do you have any thoughts on that? Well, um, you know, I think philosophical differences do do matter a lot. I think. Um, you know, we were talking a while ago about top-down versus bottom-up. I think there's, um, you know, one philosophical viewpoint that is very top-down that sees kind of the the expert as kind of being at the center of history, you know, that the sort of great experts and great leaders are at the center of history and can can kind of uh, take a... a you know, society is kind of malleable and changeable according to what the the experts recommend for expert interventions and what the leaders follow through on based on the wise guidance of the experts. And that's, uh, that's kind of a whole philosophical approach to, to social change that was characteristic of, you know, really first started in the 18th century Enlightenment. So this, these philosophical differences go back a long way. You know, the, a lot of the uh, Enlightenment folks inspired the, the French Revolution, which, of course, was very much a top-down kind of kind of attempt to remake a society all at once. And the contrasting viewpoint was given at the time of the French Revolution by Edmund Burke, who said, no, 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 this is, you can't just, you know, start with a blank slate and tear everything up and start from scratch. You have to have realized that institutions evolve for a reason. Experts never have enough knowledge to know exactly how to remake society. It's, uh, it's really... Um, something that, you know, the the experts have to be very humble and modest and say, well, you know, what incremental, gradual changes can we make that will make things better? I think that's that's really the philosophical difference. You know, Collier and people like him, or Jeffrey Sachs, of course, also are very much in this this first camp of um, kind of uh, what uh, Karl Popper called utopian social engineering. You know that you can kind of engineer society to move it towards utopia, and I'm in the much more in the camp, uh, philosophical camp of the, uh, the the sort of evolutionary, gradual kind of uh, kind of thinker who's pessimistic about how much you can just uh, you know radically remake society with the the aid of a, a few experts. Yeah, you're less fun at parties, though. I, 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 I think you're right. I, well, I think I, uh, you're right. Um, I, don't, I, I don't get to uh, tra- tour Africa with Angelina Jolie like Sachs did. So Life is tough. Clearly, clearly, I backed the wrong horse here. <laughs> yeah. But, yeah, uh, no I no think, doubt. Uh, I think the historical evidence is very much on my side. French well, revolutions. Communism. The, the French Revolution didn't work. The uh, the gradual path has worked wonderfully for the U.S. and the, and the United Kingdom and uh, other rich societies. But the the romance of utopia is is um, timeless and enduring. It's it yeah, fascinates yeah. me how yeah. after our last attempt to remake uh, humanity uh, in a grand scale, which would be the the Russian Revolution uh, being the most obvious, uh, that no one argues that well it 
worked pretty well. No one argues – well, it almost made it. Everyone understands it was a human and social and, and economic disaster. But when I look at it, I mainly look at the, at the human side, not the economic side. I, I mainly yeah, look at the, yeah. at the, the gulag. Yeah, the death toll yeah. and the lack of oh, life yeah. in, in that society, the the fear, and yet oh, yeah, yeah. people respond I mean, to Stalin, it. Stalin killed more people than Hitler. Yeah, and 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 yet people respond to it by saying, "Well, you know, we just we'll get it right this time." It's very, um, it has a deep, deep seated appeal for I think many many people. Yeah, well, you know, the um, people are impatient. They want to see social problems solved right away, and. Yeah. Uh, you know, it's kind of a tough sell to say that change is gradual and evolutionary when uh, when someone else is promising that they can, you know, re-engineer society to solve problems overnight. Now, some would argue that aid to really help the poor simply hasn't been tried, that much of what we call aid is really working to achieve other goals, as your colleague Bruce Buenita Mosquita has argued here in previous podcasts. Does that open the door at all for the possibility that there could be aid, even though we just we just haven't tried it yet? We just have to structure correctly. Do you have any optimism there? Well, as you just said, that that argument has the, a little bit of flavor of uh, you know it, it does work. It's just never been tried hard enough. Yeah, I didn't think about that. The, I wrote that yeah. question before we got into this. Sorry. <laughs> Which is uh, you know a lot like the. Uh, Oh, communism, uh, true communism has never been tried. Uh, Christianity has never been tried. You know, it's that, it's that kind of argument. Um, and actually, these, um, it's certainly true that aid was given for some, some bad reasons. And uh, that's another thing that we can test in the data. You know, we can uh, kind of discriminate between aid that was given for bad reasons and aid that was given for good reasons and see if the good reason aid does better. And unfortunately, so far, nobody has found any any convincing evidence that aid given for good reasons does does any any better than aid given for bad reasons. There, are, you know, despite all the uh, sort of headline grabbing um, Cold War episodes, like uh, giving a lot of aid to the, that thug, corrupt thug Mobutu in Zaire, you know, there are there are many more countries that were uh, tiny and not strategically important to anyone in the Cold War. Nobody cared about them, and yet they still got a lot of aid just because, you know, foreign aid bureaucracies also existed to promote development. They were not purely there for um, Cold War purposes. And uh, so a lot of aid did go into small, poor societies, and it it didn't lead to growth in those societies either, unfortunately. I think where, you know, if I can now try to say something positive, I think... You You still have plenty of time. We're going to get to it. You can can jump in now. Go ahead. I think the... uh, you know, the utopian expectation for aid is never going to be realized, that the idea that aid can sort of be the main vehicle by which a society jumps out of poverty into prosperity. I think that that hope is never going to be realized. It's it's a false hope. Uh, but that aid could do a lot of good things for poor people. I think that there we can say there is there is evidence and, and there are successes. There is there is some positive track record where, you know, smallpox was wiped out, uh, antibiotics drastically lowered infant mortality in Africa and other poor countries, uh, vaccination programs also contributed to lowering lowering infant mortality, uh, you know, by, by a large amount in Africa and other poor countries. And, and aid was involved in these in these health programs. So, uh, you know, that's a, that's a success story that we can point to. It, yeah, didn't, uh, it didn't end poverty, but it, it really improve the lives of an awful lot of poor people. That's an important point, which I hope we'll come back to. Uh, but I want to st- I want to talk about those bureaucracies for a moment. Um, people that we would characterize or characterize themselves as anti-globalization, and I, I've always been puzzled and fascinated by what those folks have in mind. They don't have quite the same thing that I have in mind when I talk about globalization. When I talk about globalization, I'm thinking about people trading across borders and exchanging ideas and goods and sometimes uh, immigrating and emigrating. But the anti-globalization crowd, which includes some eminent economists, uh, they look at globalization as being, in some sense, the product of the IMF and the World Bank. Right, and that right. somehow these two uh, bureaucracies that we've been picking on uh, ourselves, 
But they, they put a much more serious charge at their door, which is that they've created poverty and, and oppressed people by imposing markets and trade as solutions to their as false solutions in the minds of these anti-globalists and that, that we've harmed poor people. The IMF and the World Bank have harmed poor people by miring them in a, in, 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 inside world trade. Uh, is there any truth to that? Well, uh, I would, um, you know, I, I have some sympathy for um, those kind of arguments of the anti-globalization protesters. Not that I, not that I think that um, imposing free markets created poverty necessarily. Um, you know, it could, it's certainly possible that some very badly designed so-called free market reform could have in, increased poverty in any one country. Uh, but I, I don't think there's any strong evidence on average that that the, the, the pro-market initiatives of the World Bank and IMF caused, caused more poverty. Uh, but I, I'm sympathetic to the anti-globalization protesters that, you know, you, these are not things that you want to, to force countries to do. You know, if free markets are so good, then people within poor societies should choose of their own volition to, uh, to adopt free markets. And when you when you force these things on on societies, and particularly when you force them in some very particular form that is designed by the bureaucrats, who again once again don't have enough knowledge to to get things right, even when they're using free market rhetoric, uh, you know you you really set yourself up for a big backlash. Um, you know that's I think one of the reasons why free markets are on the defensive now, say in Latin America, with people like Hugo Chavez and. Evo Morales in Bolivia and the president of Ecuador and Daniel Ortega in Nicaragua. You know, why have all these guys been winning elections? It's because they say, well, you know, the, the market is just uh, something the, those evil foreigners forced on us, you know, and so anything that has gone wrong in the country is the fault of the foreigners. And then, then you win an election based on a populist anti-market platform. So I, ironically, the one of the biggest damage... One, one of the biggest ways in which market the cause of markets has been damaged has been by um, their overzealous uh, friends in the IMF and the World Bank who, who seek to sort of coercively impose them on countries that uh, haven't yet decided to choose them of their own volition. You know, you can't. Uh, I'm a fundamentally a big believer in in freedom, and you can't uh, you can't force other people to be free. You know, that's a contradiction in terms. It's like saying, you know, we. Well, the um, the secret of individual freedom is not to let anyone order you around. You know, to act in your own act in your own interest. Well, so how can you impose that system? Well, do you do you order someone not to take orders? That's a, that's a, a contradiction. You know, it, it doesn't work. It doesn't it doesn't spread freedom to coercively impose freedom on somebody else. Well, I agree with all of your your critiques of our attempts to do that. Although it. it a nation is not an actor. A nation can't yeah. choose. So in many yeah. of these situations, um, a thugocracy at the top is going to want to prevent the dispersion of power that free markets certainly, bring about. Certainly, certainly. Um, that's a very good point. Um, you know, it is certainly true that the uh, political process is often hijacked by, by thugs or by, uh, or by rich elites who are just seeking to preserve their own privileges at the expense of the poor majority. And um, in those cases, you know, what, what I'm saying about uh, sort of a democratic backlash is not, it's not so applicable. But it seems like that there is a, a kind of a genuinely de- democratic backlash against markets. Also. Yeah, I agree. That, uh, that, you know, in places where there were reasonably fair elections, people really voted against markets. And I think it's, uh, you know, because... Um, Xenophobic populism was kind of a winning political platform after uh, after 20 years of being bossed around by the IMF and the World Bank. Yeah, I, again, I'd encourage our listeners to return to Brian Kaplan's podcast on the myth of the rational voter, where he points out that this problem is not limited to poor countries, but rich countries as well. Uh, there's an anti-market uh, bias. But uh, having said that, it is a it is an interesting situation. And again, I'd like your take on the empirical evidence for this. Uh, 
so it's one thing to say, well, you know, when you have a thug at the top, he's not going to impose free markets on his own free will, of his own free will. It's not in his interest. The people might want it, but he's not going to give it to them. So we should impose it for the people. Of course, the thug then just says, I don't think so. If, if the thug doesn't have the incentive uh, on his own uh, to adopt free markets, it's unlikely he's going to be able to be pressured even by uh, the IMF. So I'm curious uh, – in the past, it's my impression, I don't know this literature very well, I know you know it quite well, the IMF and its structural adjustment policies would often conditional make loans conditional on an autocrat reforming in some dimension. Uh, and yet, that reform rarely happened, is my impression, and the right. loans That's kept right. coming, correct? That's right. That's what happened. Um, and basically what happened is, uh, is it goes back to the problem that uh, – the rationale of bureaucracies is to keep the money moving. And so the, the threat to of the IMF or the World Bank to withhold funds if the conditions are not met is not really very credible after the fact. Even if the conditions are not met, their incentives are to, to keep pushing the money out the door. And so that we sort of got the worst of all worlds with the whole structural adjustment attempt to um, to kind of coercively impose free markets on some some unwilling uh, thugs and other political actors that we we allowed them to use as an excuse the uh, you know the the meddling of the IMF and the World Bank for anything that went wrong and so ironically we we may have perpetuated the ability of the thugs to stay in power because we gave them a you know a, kind of helped them with their xenophobic populism platform by giving them some natural villains in the IMF and the World Bank. But surely well, some some countries turned out to be a little bit improved. Uh, uh, yeah, I mean there is um, there yeah. is another tendency that we should note, which is more hopeful, which is uh, the on on average most countries have been moving away from extremely populist and interventionist uh, economic programs in in favor of you know macroeconomic stability. Um, Moving away from enormous distortions of prices like extremely overvalued exchange rates or extremely negative real interest rates in favor of, of more you know, reasonable market determined exchange rates and interest rates. And uh, that, it, that doesn't mean that conditions, that the aid conditions or the structural adjustment conditions worked because it turns out that that movement is pretty much uncorrelated with any any intervention by the IMF or the World Bank is just a worldwide trend that most countries have been moving away from the most extreme kinds of interventionism. We have an essay up at the Library of Economics and Liberty on uh, Indian economic uh, evolution uh, that suggests that India did respond to an IMF loan. Do you think that's true? That, that was part of the liberalization that took place in India? Well, you know the old saying, uh, success has a thousand fathers. Sure. <laughs> Every, everyone... Is crowding in, wanting to uh, gain a piece of India's success, and say it was thanks to me that India uh, India did so well, and the IMF is certainly part of that crowd. But you're skeptical. I'm I'm skeptical. Yeah, the IMF had a very minor role in, in India over the last few decades. Uh, but there there, were, there was one stabilization package that was a pretty minor event in India's economic history. But there are a number of countries, India being one of them, China being the most obvious other one, and, and there are many more that have managed to grow and grow dramatically, uh, you argue, without much intervention from the West. And uh, what have they pursued that has worked well, and what what hope is there that those uh, techniques can be at least imitated, if not if, – if we avoid the mistake of imposing them, at least other nations can learn from them? Well, I'm glad we're finally getting to the good news. Yeah, here we are. We're in the last that quarter. Is, this is the uh, this is the good news. You know, uh, China and India, of course, have you know, two and a half billion people between them, and they um, they have had marvelous growth over the last twenty twenty five years. Uh, and uh, we've seen you know the greatest mass exit from poverty in human history, thanks to the growth of India and China, uh, and actually even. Um, even other countries that are less celebrated have, had, have still had decent enough growth to see a lot of exits from poverty. So our, our generation, despite all the failures of the, the experts, is actually ending poverty anyway. Uh, it is 
it is fueling the escape from poverty of, of you know, billion after billion uh, of poor people that are, are leaving the levels of poverty to, to ascend towards middle incomes and hopefully eventually higher incomes. And how are they doing it? Well, that's the million-dollar question that there's no no one pat answer for. I think um, I think one key is that it looks that one one common element. I think there are two common elements of the success stories. Um, first of all, is that in almost all cases it, it's very homegrown. It's um, you know it's reformers in power operating uh, on their own volition, operating by trial and error. Not necessarily democratically accountable, of course, which they obviously are not in China. But um, you know, it's homegrown. It's people, uh, politicians who have their own uh, political careers at stake. If the economic program works or not, uh, you know, trial by trial and error, finding economic programs that work. And the second is the second common theme is a general movement, as we were already discussing, a general movement away from. Uh, central planning and growth state intervention in favor of more market mar- mechanisms, including uh, participating very vigorously in international trade and really taking advantage of globalization and international trade to uh, to fuel the success. That's certainly a big part of the story of China and India. So a combination of kind of homegrown trial and error combined with uh, taking advantage of, of market mechanisms so seems, the- to be the, uh, seems to be the... The common element. Now, that's um, that's not a recipe. You can't sort of write a, a a ten point program down for some poor country to be guaranteed to achieve the same growth as China and India. Um, but it's it does say that a lot of success is possible. So that's that's one cheerful note. Our other cheerful note we've already mentioned, which is that despite the economic stagnation of much of Africa and parts of Latin America, there are improvements in many human dimensions, uh, yes. infant mortality, life expectancy, health generally. Yes, and, also uh, education is uh, yeah, and education. Has seen a lot of improvement. Uh, literacy lo- levels have risen dramatically, educa- primary and secondary enrollments have risen dramatically in Africa. Which so is all, there's been success good. there also. Uh, there are a lot of wonderful things in the white man's burden. Uh, I want to Semi close with a, a lengthy quote, which was my favorite. Uh, my favorite quote in the book, although there are many nice passages, but this to me sums up uh, the way I understand your uh, your worldview, and I want to use it as a jumping off point for a final uh, bit of what I hope is optimism. Here's the quote: When you're in a hole, the top priority is to stop digging. Discard your patronizing confidence that you know how to solve other people's problems better than they do. Don't try to fix governments or societies. Don't invade other countries or send arms to one of the brutal armies in a civil war. End conditionality. Stop wasting our time with summits and frameworks. Give up on sweeping and naive institutional reform schemes. The aim should be to make individuals better off, not to transform governments or societies. Once the West is willing to aid individuals rather than governments, some conundrums that tie foreign aid up in knots are resolved. Those so unlucky as to have warlords or kleptocrats as leaders will still be eligible for aid. The West can end the pathetic spectacle of the IMF, World Bank, and other aid agencies coddling the warlords and kleptocrats. It can end the paternalism and hypocrisy of conditionality. It can end the inherent contradiction between country ownership and dictating conditions from Washington. Remember, aid cannot achieve the end of poverty. Only homegrown development based on the dynamism of individuals and firms and free markets can do that can do that shorn of the impossible task of general economic development aid can achieve much more than it is achieving now to relieve the sufferings of the poor so i'd like to close close quote so i'd like to close our conversation with what you think is how aid might be restructured or how aid agencies might be restructured to make a difference well thanks for reading the quote well, it's lovely, something, isn't it? I, something I believe with every fiber of my being, and uh, that's what keeps me going. You know, is that there is there is hope for for the poor and for making aid work better if we just stop doing some of the really stupid things we're doing now and start focusing on helping real individuals. Uh, I think you know there are all kinds of wonky reforms that the aid agencies that we could talk about to make make them work better. You know, kind of. 
exploring things like having independent evaluation of all of a, a large sample of their projects really and programs, idea. and then really holding them accountable for the results of those evaluations, so that they they get a larger budget if they have good evaluations, and their budget is cut if they have bad evaluations. And so we evolve towards uh, redirecting the money towards people who find things that work. Uh, say something about globalgiving.com, an organization you mention and a website you mention in the book. Uh, because for me, one of the um, things that I would encourage people to at least favor and support, although I'm not sure how to be an activist about it, would be to eliminate the IMF and the World Bank, although I have to again say I have wonderful friends who work there and I hope they would find even better employment. And since this probably isn't going to happen, I hope they don't hold it against me. But if we got rid of the IMF and the World Bank and we told the American people that we weren't doing anything collectively as a nation to help world poverty and that we as individuals were free then to pursue uh, our own collective solutions, banding together with other people, then opportunities like globalgiving.com I think would be even more successful. So tell us yeah, what, what yeah. it does and how it's uh, succeeded. Yeah, well, I think the, the idea of globalgiving.com was to – Eliminate the, the the dysfunctional bureaucracy that is right now the middleman between those who want to help and those who who need help. And uh, the global giving idea is just to have a website in which donors and uh, and those who are doing projects on the ground to help the poor can find each other. And in a totally decentralized kind of market driven way, it's been you know. Uh, the, one metaphor that's been used for global giving is sort of eBay meets foreign aid. You know that uh, people shop aid projects on uh, online in globalgiving.com, and they, if they if they look good, then they attract funders. And there are kind of um, mechanisms to make sure that nobody gets is absconding with the funds or is cheating or whatever. Or another mechanism you could think of sort of an online dating service between those who need help and those who want to give help. You know that, and uh, in, in principle, it's not it shouldn't be that hard. You know, there's an awful lot of need in the world, and there's an awful lot of goodwill in the world to help the needy. So we just need to find an efficient matchmaker to uh, bring the two together. And how do they make sure? I, I know it was started by a couple of former World Bank employees, uh, and and came out of a World Bank project, I think, um, which is a, another mm-hmm. plus for the World Bank. <laughs> Mm-hmm. Uh, in, a, in a very short list in this podcast. Mm-hmm. Uh, how, how did they ensure that – and the, I should tell the listeners who haven't gone there yet, and, and I encourage you to go check out the website. These are very small projects, a few thousand dollars, yes. where, where yes. a, a, a small group of donors could make a dramatic difference in people's lives. It sounds good. Uh, what, what's our assurance as a donor that, that the projects are real and actually the money gets to the people as opposed to being stolen along the way? Well, they use a, a classic mechanism that has been used for a long time in free markets and in networks of merchants, which is just reputational mechanisms. Uh, you know, if anyone ever gets caught uh, absconding with funds or you know any other shady dealings, then they get expelled from the from ever being able to use uh, global giving again. And you know, that's exactly the kind of sanction that makes makes networks of merchants who do repeat business with each other uh, act honestly even though there are no even when there are no formal courts enforcing that honesty so that, that's the same idea that global giving has is they will just sort of uh, ask people to um, they, they will run some preliminary checks establish some reputation and then the reputation will build or will climb or fall from then on depending on uh, how the how the project implementer is actually doing. That's a very um, very nice idea. I, I hope it works, and uh, I look forward to checking it out and giving them some money if uh, I feel as good at the end of that checking out as I do now. Mm-hmm. Any other um, sources of optimism and of the, the small steps, which I think it really is the, the key to making the world a better place rather than the grand plan? Any other? Um, yeah. Well, I think... Um, Another thing that's hopeful about searching is that you can, in contrast to planning where you kind of fix the goal in advance of, uh, you know, having a specific education project or a specific malaria project and 
when you're a searcher, you can try anything, you know. And so all these enthusiastic young people that I that I meet when I go around and and give talks on a book, uh, you know, there there are a huge pool of potential entrepreneurs out there that could just do anything, you know. They they can try any possible idea that would work to help the poor, you know, like the the guy who's uh, presently running a a project to do irrigation pumps that are just, uh, uh, it's called Kickstart, that are uh, are uh, powered by human labor. You just pedal pedal like a bicycle, and that uh, makes the irrigation pump uh, irrigate your fields. And so that takes a resource that's abundantly available, physical labor, and uh, you know, ma- makes irrigation available when it wouldn't have been otherwise to a lot of poor people. So, you know, there's lots of discoveries like that out there waiting to be made by uh, all the enthusiastic young people who want to help the poor. And I think aid is an area where we can expect to see a lot of discoveries if people are, are will switch from the, the planner's mindset to the searcher's mindset. My guest today has been William Easterly, professor of economics at New York University, author of The White Man's Burden. Bill, thanks for being part of Econ Talk. Pleasure to be here, Russ. This is Econ Talk, part of the Library of Economics and Liberty. For more Econ Talk, go to econtalk.org, where you can also comment on today's podcast and find links and readings related to today's conversation. The sound engineer for Econ Talk is Rich Goyette. I'm your host, Russ Roberts. Thanks for listening. Talk to you on Monday.